there has been a lot of effort to suppress me at the Hill for a long time now. And I have been single-handedly fighting to get any Gaza coverage for months now. The staff that we had in January is, with the exception of Robbie and I, 100% different than the staff that exists today. They have pushed out or fired every single person that was working at the Hill as of January. Like we had an intern leave in January. We took a big group picture and Robbie and I reflected back on that picture and was like, nobody in this picture is still working here from Mm -hmm. the lighting guy, you know, the sound guy, like the mic guy, like nobody's still there except for Robbie and myself. And part of what that has meant is that to the extent that there were, you know, the staff was always divided. Sorry about that. The staff has always been divided sort of, um, some people are more conservative, some are more left-leaning. But to the extent that there were any people who, even if they didn't agree with me, knew how to write in my voice and do, pull subjects and do research that they know that our left audience is going to be interested in, there was nobody there. Which has meant that if I propose an Israel segment, everyone in the room is rolling their eyes and harumphing uh, because they don't want to do it. And the language that became very common at the Hill was, um uh the Israel block. Like mm. it became clear that all the Israel news of a day, there was going to be an effort to condense it into one of 10 blocks that we eight, eight to 10 blocks that we aim to do every day. Right. So that means that if there's a story about a new bombing campaign where a bunch of Palestinians die, and there's a separate story about how um, the hostage negotiation is happening, and there's a different story about Netanyahu coming to talk to Congress, and there's a different story about college protesters doing X, Y, and Z. And there's, you know, there could be 12 different stories that are Israel related, right? It doesn't matter. There's only going to be one block. And if I suggest, oh, this clip is going viral of Jamal Bowman talking to Charlemagne the God about his his APAC challenge, it doesn't matter. Either I'm going to fight for it and there's going to be so much tension behind the scenes or I let it go and we're going to just have the one Israel block. And that is why I've been doing a lot more radars again. About a year ago, I only did three days a week. And the agreement was, if you do four, you don't have to do radars anymore. And they're very time consuming. So I said, sure. I have been doing radars and four days a week because the only way I can slip in another Israel block and all the news that doesn't get covered is to do a radar. But whereas before there was full editorial control over our radars, that too has gone the way of the dinosaur with this new producer that they hired who has started to try to change my radars and soften the things that I've said. So this has all been coming to a head over time. Why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because because of the perceived imbalance of our Israel coverage, there's been a lot of pressure to have the other side. And what that has meant is that there have been a number of guests that they have for, you know foisted on us. I've never said no to a guest. That it cannot be said of my counterpart, but never mind. I've never said no to a guest. So like Hen Medzig, I think his name was one of them. There was an Iranian woman and they come on and they don't act like guests. They come on and they say, Brianna, I'm going to try to litigate what you've tweeted about on the internet. Right. Now that puts right. me in a tough position because right. now I'm the host. I'm not supposed to be going tit for tat with you, but you are not acting like a guest, but I'm still expected to act like the host. I can't turn like, you know, I don't get permission to turn this into an adversarial uh, witness. Right. <laughs> Um, and so I have told them, I don't want to do this. Not that I don't want to talk to, you know, pro-Zionist voices, but can you find some that are, I don't know, somebody credentialed, maybe they've written a book, maybe they're a professor, maybe they're a politician, not just some guy off the internet who's mad at me or is maybe being paid by this, um, uh, Israel social media influence group, you know, like, can you just find a normal guest? So about a week ago. The producer slacks me, and I. And this is where I knew it was all going to go left. She says, a hostage family reached out to me and wants you to interview a sister. Me specifically. Not she wants to come on and talk to you and Robbie. Me specifically. Wants you to interview a sister. I knew that she was going to do what so many of these other Zionist yeah. guests have done, which setup. is try to personalize yeah, right. it. That's it was a, a setup. setup. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I told Joanne, I told the producer, this is a setup. And, you know... Are you looking out for me? The answer is obviously no. So when she started to do that at the end of the interview, like the writing was on the wall, 
That was the last segment we had filmed of that day. I came off the set and I was furious. And I was like, this is exactly what I knew was going to happen. Your job is to protect me. I'm, you know, protect the people who work for you at this institution, not basically take solicitations from the audience of people who want to line up to throw tomatoes at me on the internet because they want to spread some rape hoax lie. Yeah. Wow. wow. And, and by the way, the, the, the well, senior producer, or I don't know what his title is, but um, a senior manager came into the room for that conversation and his solution was going to be, well, we should just talk about Israel less. Why are we wow. talking about Israel so much? That is the environment you have to understand that I was in. And so whatever you think about me and, Ar- and Robbie's arguments on screen, it was infinitely worse off screen. And to his credit, like, I don't think I have to contextualize or explain how frustrated I was with Robbie on screen, but he has always been a believer in our kind of partnership in the, in the kind of show that we right. do right. and has been you know, trying to make me happy and not want to leave as I've been frankly threatening to do for months now. Um, because he believes in the project and the show. And we joke about this. He would call himself this too. It's kind of a company man and just wants everything to be peaceful so that he can keep doing the show and cashing checks and being happy. You know what I mean? Like, right. God bless him. He's right. a simple man. Right. So he has been my ally of sorts, despite personally not wanting to talk about Israel either, but he knows that compromises have to be made. I didn't really want to talk about the trans stuff as, you know, and he doesn't want to talk about Israel, but we all know that we got to play our part. And sometimes it's difficult. That, yes, um, I mean, that definitely yeah, came through, but uh, that definitely came through between you and Robbie, I'll say. But, uh, you know, I just as, as an audience member, I could definitely sense that. Um, but towards the end of the interview, the the eye roll, the alleged eye roll, which is, I, I got to say, as a sarcastic Jew bastard has who has rolled his eyes thousands of times in his life, that was a pretty mild eye roll. I mean, it was barely a detectable eye roll. Yeah, yeah. I, I've <laughs> rolled my eyes a lot harder than that, you know, for, for a lot less. She said at the end, you should believe women. And to me, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong, but that to me is what seemed like it triggered the eye roll because, well, of, oh, said, oh, really? So now you're going to you, say you personally yes, she made you it personally. about you. She didn't make yeah. it general. And she made it yeah. about believing women. It, you, you weren't rolling your eyes at the <laughs> thought of a woman being raped by a Hamas soldier. Of you were rolling not. your eyes. Oh, you're really going to go there now? I don't believe women and make because it about I won't me. repeat yes, debunked talking I mean, points about a, a mass rape hoax. That, that means I don't like believe women now. So even rehashing it. Yeah, yeah so that, of course. That like it's not what, worth, to me yeah. is what looked like it triggered, right. you know, what was it? Right. Like a, yeah. A, it, not even it's that. What I just did now, worth, uh, I think. That's, that's way more exaggerated than what you did. Yeah, I, I almost don't think it's even worth debating it because it obviously wasn't about the eye right. roll. It was about the Hill looking for months for a pretext to fire me. And by the way, right. I'm not upset about it. Like, I when I decided to stay after Katie Halper was fired, it was to test their argument that Katie's firing wasn't ideological. And... I had a long, torturous, insane conversation with Bob Cusack, um, the CEO, about the ostensible reason why Katie's, con- you know, Katie was no longer brought back to to be a commentator on the Hill. And I told him, I don't believe you. I think it's a lie. But I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to stay here going for full bore about this issue. And I guess we'll see what happens. That's what I said. I guess we'll see. And it's been, you know, I I feel for Katie because it's been a little uncomfortable almost because to the extent that I have been allowed to go for this long, it did validate them on some level, right? Although I do think there's a difference. I think that part of what was so triggering to them about Katie, my observation, and I'd be interested to hear from both of you, that there seems to be a particular ire reserved for Jewish critics of Israel. 100%. I said that exactly when it happened. I say it's anti-Semitic to fire Katie over this because she helps dismantle the idea that it is not only that the case that Jews support Israel, but that Jews have a duty to support Israel. And to have prominent Jews speaking against Israel just disrupts that whole narrative too much. So I think that's absolutely it. Yeah. Yeah. But that's also what, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. They, they cannot, they cannot have that front and center it breaks the whole narrative but part of what we have been arguing throughout is israel is not creating a safe haven for jews because first of all a world where jews literally had to flee to israel would be a world where it had it had lost its western support and if israel were to lose its western support there would be no protection for Jews who went to Israel. They'd be swallowed up by the surrounding 
countries in about five minutes. So that that mm-hmm. basic premise is absurd on its face. Aside from that, in reality, Israel causes a great deal of anti-Semitism because of Jews who present to the public the notion that Zionism and Judaism are synonymous. Okay, so people see a genocide being committed in Gaza. They start to learn the facts about the history of Israel and the displacement of the Palestinian people, and you're putting in people's minds that that's what Judaism is. And then when they, because of every effort that you've made, to ensure that they think Judaism and Zionism are the same thing, they say something that is anti-Semitic with that misunderstanding, then you're going to call them anti-Semites. It is not making us safer. It's endangering us. Yes, it's almost like non-Zionist Jews are human shields. We are used as human mm-hmm. shields for yeah. Zionists. That's what we are. We are We are the human shields. We are the ones you throw us up and say to criticize The Israeli project is to criticize Jews. You can't hit Israel without hitting Jews, Mm. right? That's that's the whole play. Yeah, I've been I've been struggling with that a little bit in my last radar. um, I was talking about that Bill Maher clip where he does his classic Islamophobia. Actually, frankly, ever since the dissident dialogues event, I mean, I don't. This is going to sound sort of naive. I don't mean it in this naive way, but like it really hit home for me how much the whole basis of defending Israel's behavior and the Zionist project more broadly is so inextricable at its core from Islamophobia. Like when I was, when I was sitting there in that room, um, you know, there's this argument that I ran off the stage and called everybody racist. No, the comment, I did make a comment. I made a comment about how like, frankly, appalled I was by the open Islamophobia that was being um, expressed both on the panel and in the reactions from the audience. Um, right. At one point, there was like a, we, I was saying some statistics about the number of children who had died or something like that. And I heard a cackle, like a like a singular, like audible cackle yeah, from a woman that. sitting down in the front row. And I just turned and looked at her. Like, it was weird to be so proximate to people who had absolutely no shame about having views that are so essentialist and so out of step with what we consider to be polite in society. And to just look at them in the eye and them to look you back with absolutely no shame. I, I came home. This is going to sound again very melodramatic. I'm sorry. I'm feeling a little confessional today. But I called my mom and I was like, I'm not saying this is me. It's not about me. It's about what this means about how they feel about Palestinians. It wasn't about anti-Black right. hatred. It's about a- a- Islamophobia, um, uh, anti-Arab hatred. But I said to my mom, I like, I couldn't stop thinking of like those pictures of Ruby Bridges, like integrating schools, like in the, the high school students in the South integrating schools with like those crowds of spitting and jeering right. white students right. that didn't want them to come. Like I think of that, those images with some historical distance. And it, I was, I was like mm. chilled mm-hmm. by the right. reality and the openness of the Islamophobia that was being expressed in the room and how core it was to the arguments that were being made when Moynihan says, you know, it's not like they're Danes moving in. You can't let these people come here. You can't let them have a right to return. Yes, yes, yes. Israel's a great country because Arabs and Jews live side by side. Aren't we a great Western democracy? But also, if you let in any more, then they'll rip us to shreds because they're savages, right. unlike right. Danes. I suspect, and you know, this is the weird conversation that we're having when people talk about Zionism these days. Credible to me that I'm like, I thought this was a settled matter. Zionism is about this creation of the state of Israel, which was created. Are you a Zionist or are you an anti-Zionist? What I'm trying to figure out is if, if my opponents here believe that the state of Israel should exist at all, and if we should wipe a UN member nation off the map, because that is effectively what right of return is. The right of return is not take 7 million refugees, and this number expands. These are people who have never been in the area, have resettled other places. And you know, Benny Morris's book is a, far more nuanced than that is allowing, uh, that there were people who were expelled, there were people that were forced out by their own side, et cetera, Benny Morris. And Benny Morris has actually said this, I mean, you quoted him, so let me go to him, that if you do have right of return, which by the way, seven million people doesn't mean seven million people that go to the West Bank and Gaza. 
very specifically doesn't mean that. It goes to what Israel is now. And what Morris said, and I think it was an article tablet, he said, you know, the, the response to this is if you think October 7th is bad, this is going to be a giant bloodletting. This is not as if you're, um, seven million Danes are coming in. These are people who have an ideological predisposition. Right. And right. like nobody questions that rationale because the belief that they are savages is so in bed. Well, and you and you see it in that in that debate where I, I think it's uh, Eli Lake who lays out, you know, just this core assumption how they educate their children. And and when we when we have you on, I'm, we're going to hold this. I want to get into some of what was actually said in this panel. Yeah, because we could we could show you footage of what Israelis teach their children that'll that'll curl your hair. So so it's just it's it, it, oh yeah now they they need to be educated what they need to be educated into believing that being displaced from their homes is a good thing like what what exactly do you mean what what do they need to learn that they don't so yeah that is core listen you you were just there for that you had a comedian so called comedian who went up there Bridget Fatassi I think her name yeah. is she she literally said and I did I wish I had filmed. I don't know if they would even have the balls to drop this clip without cutting this out. She goes, you know, they say the uh, the people in Gaza, they're they're oppressed, but I've never seen an oppressed people with so many TV cameras around them. <laughs> that was. Yeah, I well, what uh, you're talking thing. about there. I mean, <laughs> it, the way it functions, it it is racism in the way it functions. It functions the exact same way on October 7th. I said, okay, we are about to feel like Atticus Finch in the courtroom. Not to compare myself to Atticus Finch, but that's not the point. The point is, Atticus Finch had an open and shut Simple case. country podcast. He was defending a guy who was obviously <laughs> innocent. He knew he was innocent. He knew this white woman was, you know, saying he did something that he didn't do. He knew all the facts were on his side. He knew all logic was on his side. And he knew it would not matter. Because yeah. the people he was appealing to were immovable in their bigotry and that they were going to rule guilty no matter how strong an argument he made, no matter how obvious it is. And that's how I felt. Like, we are about to come out here and say that forcible displacement is wrong. <laughs> Occupation is wrong. Apartheid is wrong. Collective punishment is wrong. and. It's going to be clear as day to us and to many around us, but it's not going to matter. We are going to lose because these people are immovable in their hatred, in yeah. their racism, in their view yeah. that whatever arguments we make do not matter because the Palestinian people simply do not matter. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And no matter what we say, that is never going to move them. Eli Lake will never be moved by truth, by reason, by logic. He has no empathy. He has no compassion. These are broken people. We could tell we've Russell and I have talked about this. A lot of these just Zionists are broken people. They have generational trauma from the fact that they were not able to fight against the Nazis. And they take that yeah. out on a vulnerable population. Okay, I mean, probably Eli a Lake is like 45 or something, right? No, he's <laughs> just a pig. He's just a disgusting fat pig. He's not, but I'm like, talking I have about, a certain amount of grace for no, like a 75 no, year old just, Jewish I'm man, talking you know? About, I'm talking yeah, that's a different, like I said, I hesitated to go there. It just came out because I was on a roll. But anyway, I can rein that in. The point is, I, I it was obvious to me that no matter our arguments, we would lose. And that's right. that's how it felt to argue for civil rights in the Jim Crow South. You're speaking what is the most obvious truth in the world, and it does not matter. I, I had the woman next to me because she just assumed no one who is not one of them would have gotten into that room with a press pass. Mm -hmm. So during your panel, she's gone. every time you interject, she's such a bully. Oh, my God. She's so terrible. <laughs> like that. I, that was that was the cow. Can I say about that, of, too? The, we all know about Gish Gallup, right? So... It's a really tough. Well, let me say a couple of things about this. One is that the if the if they wanted to have a real debate about this issue, they obviously would not have reached out to me, and they would not have reached out to my what was the, who's supposed to be my co-panelist Nathan Robinson, who ended up dropping out uh, last minute. They would have reached out to Norm Finkelstein, Max Blumenthal, Aaron yep. Maté, etc. Right. So it clearly wasn't about that. 
which was you know that's well i don't uh, you know I, that's on well, that's I on me i, I guess <laughs> also and that's fair enough for, to accept the imitation as i told you after russell like i didn't want to do it <laughs> it was and, so funny I'm sorry. Like, I don't I don't mean I, to cut you off, but when Russell was talking ahead. about how he's going to cover this, I'm looking at the guest list. I'm like, oh, what a fucking nightmare. We're going to have to cover this. And then I saw your name. I'm like, oh, well, if Brianna's there, it can't be that bad. But now I realize you never even wanted to go. <laughs> well, no, I didn't want to go. And they presented it to me, you know, like they always do. We're so open. We're dissident mm-hmm. voices. Like we're free speech. They're like, there's leftists here. And I looked at, the, I remember looking at the list and being like, Who's the left is supposed to be like Anna Kay from Red Scare? Like that was the best, like that was the most ostensibly they, left person well, they, that I saw. They kept men. Uh, their their she, their human shield was uh who who's the who's the who's the uh critical feminist? What uh, what was her name? The lesbian At, who uh, didn't uh, like uh, the pronouns. What? Stock Kathleen Stockton, Stock Kathleen Stock Stock yeah. Stockton. Uh, I don't even they, know. They, don't they even kept know. hiding behind her. I, I don't know if you saw it, but I did about six minutes. Like you saw the clip that I tweeted out. But I interviewed oh, yeah. Dash and um, yeah. and Winston for about five, six minutes. And I asked both of them exactly what you're saying. What? Why don't you have Norm Finkelstein that you're in his town? Like, exactly. why, you know, Max. Especially Aaron. when when they had a drop open at the vacancy, like that would have made a lot of sense. Even Katie is in New York. Like uh, Katie, that would have made a lot of sense. Katie too. They, they said, and this is, this is up on YouTube. I'll send it to you. They said we, uh, and actually what you said to me lent some credibility to that. So I don't know because I know they really had to twist your arm to get you to do it. They said it was hard to get, people yes. to agree to do this which i guess because of what you said so I, I told some, you this back norm would do it in a second i think norm would do it absolutely and especially if i mean i would have asked him and i think he also would have kind of done it as a favor with me i think we, we enjoy each other a great deal and i think we would have had a lot of fun but russell i told you this afterward like i like kind of as a joke it was like i don't want to do this so let me just ask for twice as much money <laughs> i was kind of like okay I know I'm running on borrowed time at the Hill. Let me let me save up for winter. Let me see if they'll just double my double the offering and maybe I'll go. Like, you know what I mean? Like thinking there's no right, way that they were, right, were going to do right. it. They're like this is going to be my that. out. Like, oh, well, I guess I can't do it then. Bye. And then they met me most of the way. <laughs> and I was like, well. So that. Uh, <laughs> see, by the time I interviewed them, you had told me that, which is why I didn't really push back when they said that, because I was like, well, they get they had to like but give that's three only, more money. This is this is a lesson about being mercenary. <laughs> I wouldn't call it necessarily being mercenary. I'm like <laughs> genuinely just saving saving for the winter right now. But like, you know, this is that was that was a lesson to myself that these kinds of things aren't ultimately worth it. Um, but why did I bring all that? Oh, the bullying point. It is it's it's frustrating um, to get that when you're dealing with someone who is doing actual gish gallop. And I think the moderator, obviously, he showed his colors calling me D.I. Barbie and all that stuff after the fact. But even yes. just just if we can have like a substantive conversation about how one moderates a debate and not make it all personal. I think if he had not been on the stage and Eli and I were able to just go back and forth and interrupt each other and respond directly to the individual points that were being made, instead of having to remember 20 minutes later that he lied five times before and trying to like go back and excavate all of that, it would have right. just been a healthier debate. So Eli's out there saying things like, I remember this one instance in particular, the day before I had come, like the Thursday, we had just covered on the Hill that the story that the uh, Netanyahu had threatened to punish the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank if ICC warrants were issued, right? It was a big Axios headline. I covered it on the Hill. It was very front of mind because I had just done it on the show the day before. Somehow that, that ends up coming up in the exchange. And Eli does one of these like joker laughs that he thinks is a yeah. substitute for an argument. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's like, you're making that up. And I'm like, what? Like, I... No, it's literally just happened. And then the audience roars and everyone and then the moderator, there's no like, well, Brianna, can you prove it? Like, can you elaborate? Nothing. So, yeah, I'm going to interrupt to try to push back against you making these blanket claims that the facts that we are reading into the record are somehow untrue. And I would I would note that my co-host 
co-debate partner or what have you, did not get that same kind of pushback. He he did not. And actually, not long after the clip that Constantine dropped, um, there's a moment where Eli Lake actually gets stumped by your partner. What was his name? Jake Stein? Was that his name? Um, uh, not Stein. I'm so sorry to forget. It is Jake. I'll pull it up. Go ahead and tell the story, though. Um, where he he brought notes and he pulled up Netanyahu um, either refusing a two-state solution or, yeah. or talking. And um, Eli Lake said, hey, where did he say that? Because he had denied that he ever said that. And he right. gets busted and he's just he's just frozen right Klein, there. Jake he, Klein. Klein. He, so he really has no argument. And the fact that Constantine, I just I just really want to get this out there on the show because I'm the only real witness to what happened. Who's not one of these guys. <laughs> you were not crying. The fact that they're lying about that, you were out of my sight for maybe 20 seconds. So they have, and unless you burst into tears and recovered of course not. very, very <laughs> quickly, you have like silent film star skills that nobody <laughs> is aware of. Um, I, yeah, because I wanted to catch you and I could tell from your body language, not because you were throwing a mic, but I could tell you were not going to stick around. So I well, went, I, I was I, literally, went, I mean, I'm not trying to be like that person, but the energy was so I didn't think that someone's gonna come up oh, and you know punch me in the face, but it was so hostile. Like I wanted to get out no, of the room. Oh no, no, no. And and who could blame you? And and this is where I mean for me, this is part of what I mean about this experience being very clarifying. And part of what was clarifying was actually watching you in that situation, in that context. You know, you mentioned at the top about you know divisiveness and and arguments and you sit in a room of these ghouls and watch somebody who you agree with essentially we might agree disagree on a couple of points but essentially agree on everything and you watch a room full of these just psychopaths howling for blood howling at the at a joke about Palestinians not being de they're not Danes. <laughs> you, know, you watch that. It's yeah. very, it's very clarifying. It puts a lot of these this yeah. left infighting in context. It really shows you who the enemy is, what you really need to be getting together to fight against. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.